Hello and welcome to this programme from Bailey Gifford, the latest in a series where we talk to the fund managers of the group's different investment trusts. Today we're talking to Sophie Earnshaw and Sophie is the co-manager of Bailey Gifford's China Growth Trust. My name is Richard Lander of Citywa and I'm going to be talking to Sophie about how she runs the trust. So thank you Sophie, thank you for joining us today. Uh, always interesting times in, in China and, and running money there. And you said recently it's been a volatile 12 months for the trust, and I think that followed on from an equally difficult year in 21 to 22. So how do you, as a fund manager, cope in circumstances like this? And what advice would you give to your investors about how they should cope as well? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, so at Bailey Gifford, we've invested in China um, for almost 30 years now. We've experienced cycles like this in the past, and I think the key to getting through them is really sticking to your philosophy and your process. Um, so for the China Growth Trust, we're sticking to our growth bias and we're sticking to our fundamentals-led research. Um, we've gone back to basics on most of our holdings and gained comfort from the fact that their operational performance is coming through as expected. And in addition, we've spent a lot of time working out why returns have been volatile or poor more broadly and then you know based on that understanding whether the case for, for china still stacks up and we, we think it still does um i mean if i could expand on that a bit i mean looking back over the last three years um china's faced an unprecedented series of, of challenges so we had covid uh, a regulatory clampdown and a worsening geopolitical environment these challenges have hurt private sector and consumer confidence. Um, they've negatively impacted sentiment towards the asset class and they've resulted in very weak returns. But if we look forward instead of backward, um, we think prospects for China look much brighter. So, you know, at the broad level, whilst growth in the property sector is likely to remain lackluster, you know, we think the risk of financial stability is low. Um, we think a consumption-led recovery is gradually taking shape and that the government support for the private sector is likely to accelerate this somewhat. Um, and then with geopolitical concerns, you know, whilst they're likely to remain a headwind to sentiment, we think there are signs that both sides want to stabilise the relationship. Um, and then, I mean, more importantly for us, you know, as sort of bottom-up stock pickers, um, the attractions that China offers to us remain very much intact. So whilst GDP growth overall may be slowing, um, we continue to find, you know, pockets, very large pockets, actually, of, of structural opportunities. So, you know, things, areas like healthcare, renewable energy, semiconductors, automation, domestic brands. Um, and then just on the trust portfolio itself, the, the portfolio itself remains overwhelmingly sort of exposed to these longer term disruptive and secular growth themes. And I think that's reflected in, for example, forecast earnings growth for our portfolio of around 15% per annum for the next three years versus the benchmark only, only 9%. Um, and encouragingly, you know, the operational results of many of our holdings are good or sort of on an improving trend. So we, you know, we think that with valuations attractive in both an absolute and a relative sense, um, that it's only a matter of time before you know the strong operational performance mm -hmm. is rewarded with with good share price and good returns. Excellent, excellent overview there. And before we leave and, and look forward, let's just look back a little again. You mentioned those three main factors: zero COVID, the regulatory clampdown, and those geopolitical tensions. Which did you find the most of those three? Did you find the most difficult to contend with when you were running the trust on a day to day basis? Um. I think both um, regulation and geopolitics were difficult. I mean, I think understanding regulation and the motivations behind it is really important um, when you're investing in China. Um, I mean, what we saw in the education and internet sectors, um, it was pretty painful and it led many to question how much you can sort of trust the regulatory framework. Um, we think you can in the long run um, but that shorter periods of you know, volatility are highly likely. Um, and we think that regulation and innovation are sort of intimately connected and shouldn't be sort of viewed um, in a vacuum. And I think, you know, we've had a decade 
almost of unrestrained innovation or growth in key new areas in China. Um, and I think it was actually time for you know the regulator to provide a bit of a check. And if I can just give you a couple of examples here, you know, um, transactions via WeChat Pay. So WeChat Pay is um, ten cents payment platform. They increased from basically nothing to around one billion a day over the last ten years. Now, if we put that in context, Apple Pay only price, only processes around one billion transactions a month. Or in e-commerce, for example. So Amazon is 13% of global e-commerce sales. Alibaba now accounts for 29%. So, you know, e-commerce penetration in China now dwarfs that of the US. And let's put this in context. So, you know, with the regulatory backdrop in the US, we've had 150 years of antitrust law. Chinese antitrust law was only written in 2017. And it only started to be taken seriously in the last couple of years. So China did have a lot have a lot of kind of catching up to do, not in terms of innovation. You know, it was innovating and growing much faster, but in terms of regulation. Um, and I think also if you look at the content of regulation, actually in the main, it's been remarkably sensible. And the motivation behind it has been to try and foster, I think, sustainable growth industries for the future and that's impacted in some cases short-term earnings growth but in the long in the long run we think it's actually very um supportive for the companies that we own and for their share prices i think you know the real challenge when it comes to regulation isn't the content of it it's actually the way it's implemented and that links back to china's you know top-down system of governance um where you know you get a top governor from a central bureau issu issuing a regulatory guideline. You get a very overzealous response from local regulators who are keen to impress their bosses. This results in unintended consequences, such as economic weakness, as we've seen. That draws the attention of Beijing. They clarify their position, regulations roll back, and then that balance of innovation and regulation is restored. And I think that's exactly what we've seen over the last year. We've seen the government swing from you know, a focus on disorderly expansion of capital to supporting the platform economy and supporting um, innovation. Um, so whilst we expect there to be, we don't expect this regulatory clamp, clamp down to be the last, we do expect it to be corrected and that balance, you know, to be restored. Um, and then geopolitics, I think, was the other sort of difficult one. And then, I mean, here, you know, whilst, whilst we continue to expect that, geopolitics and in particular you know the US China relationship for that to continue to provide a long term headwind to sentiment um you know particularly in the context of an up, up and coming election cycle um we do think that a worst case scenario here is is unlikely and actually over the last 6 months or so um there have been tentative signs that both sides are quite keen to stabilize the relationship so whether that's you know treasury secretary um Yellen's speech in april or um, reported comments by Secretary of State Blinken on his visit to Beijing in June. I think both of those things indicate a more sort of constructive approach going forward. And then right. just finally on the portfolio and how that relates to geopolitics, um, you know, we remain very exposed to domestic China. So around 85% of our holdings revenue comes from China with only around 5% or so from the US. Um, and as stock pickers, we do try and factor geopolitics into our stock analysis on a sort of stock by stock basis. So, you know, we're more inclined to invest in companies with strong domestic exposure and where further decoupling is likely a net benefit um, rather than a net negative. Right. So when the EU announced today that they were going to investigate whether China, China was dumping cars effectively in the EU at some sort you didn't worry you too much. It, it doesn't worry us too much. I mean, um, China, I mean, I think in particular, China China hasn't actually been that successful in um, a lot of these EU companies, uh, countries where it has been successful is uh, in EVs um, and in certain markets where EV penetration is high. Um, and here, you know, we think China has a genuinely um, sort of very strong both technological advantage um, and also cost advantage um, that I think will result actually in it doing pretty well in the long run. 
um, in terms of EV exports globally, perhaps not yeah. in the US, but I think um, potentially in Europe. Exactly. Declaration of interest, I, I drive a Chinese EV myself, so there we go. <laughs> Very interested in that. So let's focus domestically for a second. Uh, and, you know, you talk about the government wanting to get the economy growing again uh, because it, it has stalled somewhat. Uh, but how committed can the government be towards reigniting growth? Uh, because there are a lot of worries about the indebtedness in some parts of the economy, particularly the property sector. So if they go too much and help the economy in general one way, they risk reigniting problems in another way. Yeah, so debt levels do, I think, limit the government's ability to offer a very large um, stimulus package. However, gradual easing is, I think, very viable and is indeed happening at the moment. So, you know, the government had a very prudent um, approach to COVID stimulus. So I think um, COVID stimulus was around 10% of Chinese GDP versus around 70% in most developed market countries. Um, and they've also been reasonably conservative when it comes to the property market in terms of um, trying to cool that over the last decade. So I think actually the government has a number of levers that it can pull. Um, you know, China is one of the very few countries in the world that has and can continue to lower interest rates in response to economic weakness. Um, it can also, and it has begun to relax those restrictions that it put on property in the early 2010s. Um, actually, in July, um, the, the central government gave local and city governments the go-ahead to relax restrictions on home purchases. Um, and in August, we saw Guangzhou, um, a major tier one city, become the first to act. We expect others to follow suit. Um, and for this sort of gradual easing approach from the government to bear fruit, I think it's also important to remember that the, you know, the Chinese consumer and the private sector in aggregate remain actually in very good financial health. So the Chinese consumer saved up an estimated 7 trillion of excess savings during COVID. Um, and the private sector, as I said, on in aggregate remains in very good health, good balance sheets. And it's actually the private sector that accounts for the majority of GDP growth and the majority of job creation. Both the private sector and the consumer has been hurt, I think, by COVID lockdowns and by the regulatory clampdown. But I think it's only a matter of time before confidence improves and therefore spending and activity um, improves somewhat. And then just a final note on, um, you know, what macro sort of means for us. We'd actually note that, you know, macroeconomic forecasts tell us not a huge amount about long term returns for active stock investing in China. Um, so, for example, you know, China's nominal GDP in US dollar terms has grown tenfold uh, over the past 20 years. So that's around 12% per annum. Uh, yet MSCI China has only returned around 6% per annum. So these unimpressive index returns actually mask fantastic performance at the individual stock level. So, you know, for example, over five years to the end of 2022, I think Chinese companies accounted for around almost 25% of global companies who have returned 15% per annum in share price terms. Um, so it's it's not to deny that China has, you know, structural issues, um, but it's rather to show that there's this, there's a persistent gap, I think, between this sort of perceived kind of macro doom and the sort of hidden kind of micro opportunities that we're finding. And it's really, you know, these micro opportunities that where we focus our energies and it's, it's there right. that we believe we can add value for our clients in the long run. Right. Well, let's take that cue and, and drill a bit down into your portfolio and, and the stocks that you hold there. So if you had to say in a couple of sentences, you know, what what is the common thread of your investments? Uh, you know, obviously the 60, 70 stocks there. So and we'll dive into the different sectors in a second, but what is your common thread when when choosing this portfolio? Yeah, I mean, in a couple of words, it would be something like best in class Chinese growth companies. Um, uh, that basically, um, and then within that, you know, some of the sort of big structural trends trends that we've got exposure to. It would be things like early and late stage platform companies in areas like e commerce, advertising, or food delivery. Um, it would be exposure to companies um, in industrial upgrading and robotics. It will be exposure to the green transition, 
um, exposure to domestic brands um, and exposure to areas such as healthcare. Right. No, that's great. Because okay, let's just take that a little deeper. Uh, you, you mentioned the energy transition there, and um, from solar to batteries uh, are in there in your, in your uh, portfolio. Is it the case that China is doing things here that makes it a world leader, and perhaps we haven't really taken that on on board in the West? Yeah, I mean, if we if we look at the big picture first, so. Um, China imports around 70% of its oil and around 45% of its gas. Um, And actually geopolitical sort of risks um, have made energy an even more important item sort of on the national security agenda for China. And this is translated into massive incentives to invest heavily in renewables. And we've seen that over the last decade. And again, it's really private companies here that have, have led the charge. Um, So China now has around, I think it has six of the top 10 global EV battery manufacturers in the world. It makes over 70% of the world's solar cells, um, and it contributes roughly two thirds of um, new global wind power infrastructure. Um, It also accounts for almost 50% of total EVs in the world. Um, And many of the companies, you know, playing to this theme are found in our investment universe. So as I mentioned, you know, we we own um, a company called BYD. So this is a leading electric vehicle manufacturer. And we also own CATL, the world's leading EV battery manufacturer. Um, you know, actually, BYD is a, a newish, newish purchase for us. Um, it's one of the few fully, inter- fully vertically integrated electric vehicle um, manufacturers. So it's the second largest EV battery manufacturer in China. It also manufactures um, something called IGBT chips, which are crucial for things like ADAS. Um, And we think this vertical integration gives it a fantastic cost um, advantage and also a speed to market advantage. And it's really executed well on both of those opportunities um, or those advantages. It's now leader in China in the mass market EV space, but also growing um, very quickly overseas. Um, We think it's got very a very exciting prospects ahead of it. I mean, China's EV penetration is now at 30% of new car sales, but still rising, you know, very quickly. Right. I mean, where does this come from? Is it, you know, this advance that's leading the world? Is it from better universities? Is it from better training for, for people? More more investment from, from in infrastructure? Um, I think it's a, a combination of of, of two things. I mean, really, the government is is very um, keen to push the green transition and the, and the energy transition, partly because, as, as I said, for sort of energy security reasons, but also um, because they've experienced very, um, they've experienced some of the negative consequences of, of climate change, but also, you know, pollution. Um, so it was only sort of three or four years ago when, you know, smog in, in some of the biggest Chinese cities was a real issue. And that was really impacting on um, everyday people's quality of living. So the government is very keen to push the green transition. And as a result of that, they've offered, um, you know, numerous um, support packages, packages or stimulus packages, much in the same way that the U.S. is, is doing now. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you've got a very um, highly educated workforce, you've got a huge number of um, science and sort of technology graduates coming out of Chinese universities, and you've got a very vibrant um, private sector. Um, So, you know, BYD, for example, a a founder-led private sector company, its origins is in small consumer um, batteries, but it's moved into uh, EVs. Um, so it's, it's a combination of those sort of big picture sort of support from the government, um, very sort of highly age, educated population, and then a very sort of dynamic um, and sort of entrepreneurial private sector that I think has given sort of China a, a bit of an advantage here, a first right. advantage. Uh, and let's go on to the consumer plays that, that are there in your portfolio, because uh, I think, you know, four or five years ago, we talked about the amazing spending power of Gen Z in China and the development of the middle class there. And then obviously we had the pandemic and that threw everything uh, out of the window. Has that spending power, has that uh, 
uh, ability, you know, the, the desire to sort of improve one's living standard uh, and buy things for your home. Has that come back now, uh, maybe even bigger than before the pandemic? Um, so it's it's coming back. So I'd say, you know, COVID-related lockdowns hurt um, confidence and to a certain extent um, spending power. And here, I mean, don't forget that the lockdown in China only ended in January of this year versus um, 18 months ago in the West. So there's been less time for the Chinese consumer to recover. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, COVID stimulus only accounted for around 10% of GDP in China versus 70% in the West. And it also did not take the form of direct to consumer handouts. Um, instead, as I said, you know, Chinese consumers have saved up an estimated seven trillion um, dollars of excess savings, which they're only just sort of starting to unlock as, as confidence um, improves. Um, so, you know, some of our Generation Z or um, sort of consumer platforms have been hit um, by weaker spending. So we've seen, for example, Li Ning, um, which is is a preferred um, sportswear brand among younger consumers, face um, a few inventory issues and they've been increasing discounting rates, which has hurt the performance of the shares. We've also seen pop markets. Um, it's a collectibles company that's very popular with Gen Z, post a bit of a slowdown in, in 2022. Um, but for you know both of these companies, we think that that demand correction is temporary or cyclical, and that as confidence improves, um, so will so will their numbers. Um, I mean, we have started to see very good numbers from our it, for a lot of our internet platform holdings, um, which I think suggests that the you know that that consumption is is gradually sort of. Um, recovering quite well. So, you know, Alibaba, the world's leading e-commerce platform, or Tencent, um, you know, China's most popular social networking app, they both saw a return to double digit top line growth in their most recent quarterly results. Um, you know, more importantly, both companies benefit from very large structural growth opportunities. Um, and both, again, remain very attractively valued. So, for example, Alibaba's e-commerce business, if you strip out cash and investments, it's trading on a single digit price earnings multiple. Um, ByteDance, you know, our only unlisted holding, also delivering very strong, you know, double digit top and bottom line, um, bottom line growth. So um, I think we're seeing from a number of our holdings that the recovery is you know, it's slower than many expected, but it's it's gradually coming through. Right. So you, let's talk about valuation for a minute. Uh, and you mentioned some companies there that are getting into single digit price earnings ratios. Uh, just talk us through a couple that you've you've retained or indeed added to on valuation grounds. And, you know, are, are these single figure PE bargains all around for you to, to, to pick up? Um. It's well, so we haven't made any big changes to the portfolio, um, particularly in the last six months. So I think we're only running at around 5% turnover versus an average of sort of 20%. Um, but that's because a lot of our, um, you know, given the, the sort of performance of the asset class um, and, uh, you know, the private sector's sort of derating, um, a lot of our holdings have, have sort of derated. Um, and you know we we're happy with with the overall shape of the, the portfolio. So that exposure to the private sector and those pockets of structural opportunity, we think we're very well placed. Um, but there have been, I guess, a number of areas or a number of companies that we've been able to sort of take advantage of. Um, so, for example, we added to um, SG Micro and Shenzhou International. SG Micro is one of um, our sort of uh, little giant companies. So it's um, an analog semiconductor company. Um, the chips that it produces, they convert real world signals such as um, sound and temperature into digital signals. Um, and actually the opportunity for this company, again, um, I think has been increased or accelerated as a result of geopolitical tensions because, you know, one of China's biggest import bills, actually bigger than oil, is, is semiconductors. So it's keen to increase self-sufficiency there. Um, SG Micro shares have been very, very weak um, as a result of a what we think is a cyclical, a temporary cyclical dislocation. Um, so we've added to that stock um, to take advantage of that volatility. Um, we also added to Shenzhou International. This is a garment manufacturer 
Um, I think it's actually a supplier to to Li Ning. Um, and it's been hit, I think, because, um, you know, the consumption recovery story in China has sort of disappointed. But very, very well run company, fantastic management team. Um, and again, you know, an opportunity where we think this is a cyclical issue. It's a great time to add. Great. And um, obviously, you, you've you've lowered your conviction on some companies and a couple have moved out of the portfolio. What what sort of triggers that decision to say, you know, I've been patient enough, but I don't see this one working out for me? Yeah, I mean, so process process wise, we review all of our holdings on um, an eighteen month sort of rolling basis, or more urgently, um, if there's been significant news um, on the company. And in general, we tend to sell or reduce um, if the valuation is no longer attractive or if our view relative to the market's view is no longer as differentiated um, or if, you know, the investment case we think is no longer working. Um, so, you know, recently we reduced um, two companies, Eston and Innovance, both are in that um, industrial upgrading sort of robotics sort of uh, part of the portfolio. Um, Innovance in particular has actually exhibited fantastic operational performance. So for the past three or four years, it's trebled, almost trebled its revenue and profit and its share price. Um, you know, we think part of that performance is structural. So it's vastly improved the quality of its products and its technology. Um, but we think it's also benefited from supply chain disruptions um, that some of its multinational competitors experience. So we've reduced marginally on the back of strength um, and to sort of guard against a potential air pocket in terms of demand market share as these COVID disruptions ease. Um, we also partially sold uh, Tiger Med. This is one of our healthcare holdings. Um, and we completely sold a number of companies where we thought that the investment case was no longer working. Um, one of the key parts of most of our investment cases or a key, key kind of um, criteria to get into the portfolio is sort of roughly long-term alignment with the government. And we thought that Billy Billy uh, and Lufax had both sort of fallen foul of that. So we decided to sell both of those companies. All right. Uh, again, looking at the report you, you presented to shareholders a short while ago, you described China as an attractive mix of risk and reward. Uh, do you think it's getting more attractive now as, as time moves on? Um, I, I mean, Chinese equities, after a brief surge in December and January post the reopening, they've given back most of their gains and the index is still at a sort of similar level to end of 2016. Um, you know, the A share market in particular has delivered strong earnings growth, but has been derated um, over the past five or six years. I'd say more broadly, sentiment um, towards the asset class appears very negative. In an, and in our view, you know, consensus or, or the market view is too pessimistic. We think a lot of the sort of market's concerns are already priced in. And as I said, you know, we are starting to see the beginnings, we think, of a... Um, of an improvement um, in the domestic economy, particularly where where you know consumption is concerned, and then you know for us as active investors, as I said you know earlier, I, we do still think China continues to offer these big big picture sort of structural opportunities um, that should persist you know regardless of whether GDP grows at five three or one percent. So. Um, I would say that you know China still offers an attractive mis mix of, of risk and reward. Great. Just want as we as we move to the end, ask you a couple of questions about China's place in the world, uh, because you obviously have great faith in it and the companies that are making doing great things there. But there are quite a lot of large investors overseas who think that China is just uninvestable because of the capriciousness of the government, uh, and this obviously offers less support in terms of fund flow for the equities price there. Do, do, does that worry you or you just think, I'm get, let them do what they want to do and I'll, I'll, I'll do what I want to do? Yeah, um, it's, it's a good question. I think a, a couple of points. I mean, the first one, I think it's important to remember our starting point here. Um, 
So the A share market only has around three or four percent foreign ownership. You know, it's very domestically owned and focused. Um, the Hong Kong market is much more diversified, but you know, in aggregate, China's representation in, in global indices such as um, you know MSCI Acqui is less than 3.5%. It's China's weighting is actually smaller than Apple, you know, the company. So that would be the first point. Don't forget where we are, the starting point. Second, you know, we have had a really awful three years. Um, and, you know, sentiment does tend to be pro, pro momentum. So it's no surprise that I think, you know, these these um, calls that China is uninvestable have, have, have sort of gone up after the experience we've just had. Um, and I, I do think that once conditions improve, some of that sentiment may turn. And then finally, I mean, just in the longer run, we do think that there are potentially other pools of capital that could replace, you know, particularly U.S. money in the market and potentially provide support for equity prices in China if you were to see um, a real sort of marked continuation of decoupling. So, you know, pools of capital, for example, in South America, Asia or, or the Middle East. Right. Uh, and just following on from that, uh, you know, China, to a certain extent, is less the flavour of the month than it was a few years ago. And then you you have India making a big push, hosting the G20, uh, and the Middle East coming onto the scene as well to... Uh, with various initiatives to to make it a place to invest, is this going to be detrimental for China as as, as India and the, and the Middle East start to shine a bit more in the on the global scene? Um, I, again, from the sort of current starting point, I don't think so. You know, I I still think that you know as a firm we continue to come back to China as a place where you can find world class. Um, structurally growing companies and i think you know china continues to have a number of of advantages that mean that will continue this will continue to be the case for the next you know decade or longer um i mean i a little flippantly but i also know that you know the market itself is much cheaper in ag- aggregate than a market like india i think msci india is trading on historic 27 times earnings versus uh msci china on on, on 13 times so um, I think there's a bit of a, um, a valuation opportunity here as well. Great. Let's move on to some questions. One I'm going to start with is about data, saying that uh, you know when you talk about improvement in the domestic economy uh, and that people are now spend, spending, how reliable do you think is that is that data that that, that leads you to those conclusions? Yeah. Um... I think it's reasonably reliable. So we don't just rely on um, the data that the government publishes, although it, to be fair, China does publish a lot. Um, we also rely on some of our third per- third party research providers, which have or which have tried to compile, um, you know, their own activity indexes, for example. Um, we then tend to cross check the data that we uh, we receive at sort of macro level with you know on the ground um data from you know our office in shanghai and the research that we do there on the ground and also from the companies that we invest in so you know one of the most positive um signals for me recently has just been the improvement um in a lot of our companies holdings results um so as i said you know both alibaba tencent returning to double digit revenue growth after a pretty poor you know couple of years Meitu and Dianping, you know, our food delivery uh, platform company delivering very strong top line growth. ByteDance, similar situation. Um, in the industrial, a number of our industrial automation um, and broader sort of industrial holdings also starting to post um, very strong results. Um, and even in the financial sector. So, you know, one of our largest holdings, Ping An, um, a, a key uh, private sector life insurance company, also returning to um, double-digit value of new business growth. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, okay, get back to the portfolio itself. This question is, you've got one, I think you mentioned one unlisted company in the portfolio. Uh, are you keen? Is there potential to uh, increase the number of unlisted companies there? 
Yeah, again, um, we are keen. Um, we've got a, uh, a cap on unlisted investments of, of 20%. Um, and we're, we're nowhere near that cap at, at the moment. We're around, we've got one unlisted investment in ByteDance, which is around five or 6% of the, the portfolio. Um, very keen to increase our private exposure, but we want to make sure that we get the right companies in there at the right price. Um, so over the last couple of years, um, you know, we've seen a number of, of companies come to us and we haven't quite got over the line largely on valuation grounds for a number of these these companies. Um, but that isn't to say that in the future there won't be more opportunities. We think there will, um, as is the case with, um, I think, the US market. Um, you know, Chinese companies in some sectors are putting off listing until much later in their development. Um, so actually having our, having an ability to get access to these investments before they're listed, I think, could be really accretive. Um, it's one of the main benefits, I think, of the trust structure. Um, so we would expect that um, that private weighting to increase, but only with the right companies and at the right valuation. Right. OK. Uh, I, another question is, when did you actually last visit China? Have you been since the, uh, since the lifting of, of, of COVID and what did you find there? Yep. So um, I was in China in May uh, of this year. Um, it was a it was a fantastic trip. It was a joint trip with um, uh, actually both of the managers from um, uh, from Scottish Mortgage. Um, so it was a that combination was fantastic because obviously those guys um, invest globally. Um, so hearing their sort of point of view on some of their global perspectives on some of these Chinese companies was really very interesting. Um, yeah, we spent a week um, in China, um, traveling around, seeing um, most of our large um, internet platform holdings, um, including ByteDance, um, seeing some new ideas um, in the semiconductor space, um, and then seeing a number of competitors to our existing holdings. Um, I mean, what struck us, I mean, for me, I was prior to going in May, I was last there in January 2020. Um, actually, really what struck me was there was, I think there was a, from our platform companies in particular, there was a greater degree of confidence in both the domestic economy, but also the management of the domestic economy. So a lot of um positive comments um, from a number of our holdings on uh, Li Chan, the new premier. Um, there was, you know, in, in contrast to a lot of the reporting that you read in the West, there was still, I think, a good degree of animal spirits um, and a good degree of, I'd say, optimism. If you'd asked me that question sort of a year ago, I think um, we were just in a much a less good place um, in May. It was it was striking that there was it, there was more positivity basically. Um, so yeah, it, it was a, a great trip. Great great to be back on the ground. Great going back again soon or plan for uh, next yeah, year? Yes, so I'll be there again probably end of October or in November at some point. Okay, a uh, couple more questions before we have to wrap up. One is uh, we touched on this. The real estate sector is is just a bit of a mess really I think it'd be fair to say and obviously you don't invest there but do you think the problems that it's causing in the wider economy are a threat to to your portfolio um no so you know as you said first first point to make we don't have any um real direct exposure to the property sector we do think of it as um a sector that is likely to see a stabilization um, but to be sort of lackluster in terms of growth and then therefore not really an area where we'd be hunting for 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 you know for opportunities in the portfolio. Um, I think it's fair to say that the the weakness in property is having an impact on overall growth within the economy, but I think some of the um some of the headlines that we read about, you know, the risk of financial instability is yeah, I, I, we we still believe that the risk of financial instability from the the real estate sector is low. Um, I mean, a couple of points to make here. So, property sales 
are down almost you know 50 percent from their 2021 peak um so activity is depressed but prices have barely budged and i think this is this is a key point you know china has never experienced the sort of asset price bubble that has precipitated almost every property market crash in developed markets. You know, property prices have grown at around 7% over the last decade, but income growth has surpassed that. And property actually on average remains affordable. Um, And whilst, you know, developers such as Country Garden, which has hit the headlines, have become over-indebted, the Chinese consumer actually remains in pretty good health, as I've, you know, already talked about. Um, So... You know, and as we, you know, as we talked about in the conversation, the government can't, you know, offer a very large stimulus package, um, and I, I don't think it wants to, but it can gradually ease, and that's what we're seeing. And I think what we will see is just a stabilization in property, um, partly due to the government's gradual easing approach, partly due to activity improving as the consumer, as consumer confidence improves, and as private sector confidence improves. And that, you know, China will sort of kind of gradually grow out of this. Um, so we we aren't too worried about it at this at this point in time. OK. Uh, final question. Another worry, perhaps, is uh, the tensions over over Taiwan seems to be growing. Do, do you think this keeps a lid on valuations of, 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 of stocks, you know, no matter how well they're doing, how fast they're growing, how reasonable their price earnings ratios? This is looming in the background and is obviously unpredictable and we're not here to predict when or if China might invade Taiwan. But do you think that's a factor weighing down on everything? I think it has been a factor, um, you know, particularly over the last sort of two or three years. Um, But I would argue that, you know, we're in a place now where I think a lot of those concerns around um, sort of geopolitics more broadly or Taiwan are already in prices. So I think, you know, again, remember where we are, remember our starting point now. Um, and yeah, I, you know, we are, we are bottom up stock pickers. We remain very humble um, in terms of, you know, our ability to predict sort of geopolitical events. But our two cents on this would be that, you know, on Taiwan, it's a very sort of low probability, we think. Um, but high impact event, and it's low probability because of a number of reasons. You know, the incredibly high stakes involved, um, the fact that a defeat here would, I think, seriously threaten the legitimacy of the government, the fact that it would be a very difficult endeavor in a military sense, which again greatly increases the chances of failure, and then because you know the government, contrary to sort of Western reporting, um, you know the government has been i think more focused on you know on their domestic commitments um than they have been on sort of foreign policy you know these promises to increase living standards deliver a propos- uh, a prosperous society by 2035 all of these domestic con- uh, commitments would be um unachievable you know in the event of a worst case scenario so i th- i think a lot of the concerns are already in the price and that we continue you know that the, the risk of something happening here is is low probability, but obviously high impact. Right. Well, that's it. Uh, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Thank you, Sophie, so much for your time and your insights into this ever fascinating part of the world. And thank you all for watching. We do have more sessions like this coming up. Uh, so please stay tuned. Keep your, keep your eyes out for those if you found today useful. Uh, and just to thank you in the audience once again for tuning in. Mm-hmm.